And we're back for another exciting episode of The Creators Collective. We're planning on having another fun week this week, just like we have every week. And uh, I want to say a huge thank you to everyone in the live chat. We are having a good bit of fun over there. If you've never uh, been in the live chat uh, at 11 o'clock Central Time, or no, I guess it's 9 o'clock Central Time, 10 o'clock Eastern Time, we, are, we go live every Thursday. And you can join us on YouTube. So if you want to have your questions answered, that's where a lot of our questions come from. Otherwise, feel free to send an email to uh, Zach, Will, or myself, and we'll try and get those on the air. So that's enough blabbering along. Let's actually jump into this thing. So, um, Zach, what you got going on? Um, so I started on the sculpture. Well, I started a few days ago, man. This has been like, it's been... Um... It's one of those projects where it's just been fighting me the whole time. Like, uh, it sh like what should have taken me two hours took me two days just because other stuff that's been coming up. So, like, my uh, I always try and get the most out of any expendable, like to a fault. Like, I'll use sandpaper until there's like nothing left on it. I'll use, <laughs> yeah, it's just kind of my I don't know why I'm so frugal. I didn't grow up like super poor or anything, but. My, you wouldn't know by the way I, by the way i try and conserve everything that i work with so you're one of those people who use flap discs until you're in the grinder itself pretty much yeah yeah i i use things until you can't even until you can't even tell what they're supposed to be um but uh so my plasma cutter there's i don't know if you you probably i'm sure you guys have taken the tips off anyway there's there's like a bunch of different pieces that go together for the tip mm -hmm. and like there's this little rod in there and i was cutting some quarter inch plate that i'm using for the base of this sculpture and i'm like yeah it's probably time to replace something this isn't as clean as it should be and uh i take it apart and so this like tip thing that the air swirls around it's probably supposed to be i don't know like three quarters of an inch maybe five eighths of an inch long this thing is melted down to about a quarter of an inch <laughs> like it's just this glob it's supposed to be like this highly <laughs> like machined thing so that the air swirls around it perfectly and it's just this melted blob that's about a quarter of the size it's supposed to be so i'm like ah this is oh, sweet i'll change this out and it'll be like new anyway like the little tiny head that thing seized in there so it stripped out i had to take the whole gun <laughs> apart um the plastic line where the the air goes through it melted so i had to clip that off and rewire everything and re-tap this weird thread. it's like a <laughs> five by 0.8 thread pit like the weirdest just so i spent all day just running around getting parts for it took me an entire day to make two cuts like a three foot by two foot piece of quarter inch steel it took me an entire day just to get a cut it's just because i was running around trying to fix that and then and then the uh i start welding the tack and the base together and the plate is warped i'm like i'll go quarter inch that should be thick enough for a three foot section where i don't have to worry about you know it should be pretty pretty flat but uh had like a quarter inch bow in it so i did oh wow yeah i was i was kind of so it's just was like that... all all of these things that shouldn't even require attention so it's taken me two days to weld this pyramid just to get the the base the flat section little feet on it and tack up it's almost like an upside down well it's a pyramid of 18 gauge sheet metal and for a rod to go down um took me two days just to get all that tack together but i think today is the day when i'm done with this i think things are going to start moving along quickly and it's just been a super frustrating two days but it happens that that sounds ridiculously heavy it's pretty heavy well i mean i'm guessing so it's funny hopefully it'll show up in the video when i went to the metal place i think there's a video of the forklift loading it into my truck on my instagram uh this quarter inch plate and then i have i got two sheets of 18 gauge steel i back this thing up to my driveway drop my tailgate get ready to pull it out and uh it's like a cartoon me trying to pull this thing out of my truck like i put on gloves and i go up to it and nothing happens i just, <laughs> just the flex nothing is moving so i had to take two uh vice grips clamp them onto the quarter inch plate put both of my feet up against like where the bumper would be on my truck. And literally <laughs> I'm connected to the thing by my hands and by my feet. 
like pulling as hard as I could just to like shimmy the thing out of the truck. So <laughs> I don't know. I think the, the quarter inch plate, it's actually since I got it cut into the, uh, it's about like two by three and a half or something like that. I hope there's a video of that in your, your, your final build video. There should be, it's time lapse. So I don't know if it got, you know, <laughs> got the we'll shimmy in there. Yeah. But uh, I think the it's actually not as heavy as I thought. It's still plenty heavy, but just that quarter inch plate for the base is probably maybe 70 pounds. Yeah. I had it. When I built when I made a welding table, I uh, made the top out of quarter inch AR 400 and it was a four by six sheet and it took everything I had just to get it on the forks of my tractor. And then from there, I just, you know, I moved everything with the tractor, but it was heavy, heavy stuff. Yeah. Yeah, you should yeah, get one of those, Johnny. Uh, Zach. <laughs> I would love to. Yeah. yeah. I have, I have some other exciting stuff we'll talk about in a bit, but you guys have some exciting stuff too. So you guys, you guys met up recently, huh? In the flesh. Yeah. 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 Uh, tell, tell me about that. I don't really know much what you guys were doing. Well, so but, I was just there, and so I want James to tell his herring story of his travels. I'm going to tell what I did this last week, and that, that we can just get into my stuff now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah, so I, I drove uh, 14 hours out to uh, Virginia, and I hung out with um, Shannon Rogers from the Hansel School, um, and then I went down to Fredericksburg, Virginia, and uh, there's a, a guild there, a, a woodworkers uh, group, that gets together every first Saturday of the month. Um, and there were um, over a hundred people there that were um, just getting together to meet about woodworking. It was a, one of the best groups I've ever been a part of. Uh, before the meeting, they actually have a tool sale. So they have, you know, power tools for sale all the way down to all the antique tool collectors. It was kind of like a mini Midwest tool collectors meet. Uh, and then they had a, a few other ins and outs and, uh, uh, the things that they talked about. And then I had uh, about an hour long um, talk where I got to demonstrate cutting a dovetail as well as um, kind of talk through my philosophy of woodworking. And that was phenomenal. A, a great group there. So if you're anywhere near Fredericksburg, Virginia, um, definitely go, go take a look at that. It's, it's well worth it. There were people driving in two, three hours to get there for it. So um, yeah, well, well worth it. Uh, but then after that, I drove down to this, uh, uh, well, I, I, well, let me back up and tell the story because I, I punched into GPS this address that, where I know that Will lives and I get on the road and I go down the road and I'm on an interstate and I get off the interstate onto a good highway and then I get off the good highway onto a, a county road and then I'm on the, this county road and this I turn off onto a, a, like a lane and a half paved road that I go on for a while and then I get off this lane and a half paved road onto a, a one lane road and this one lane road then goes back to where there should be an address but all i see is this dirt road that goes back in this dirt road is like a roller coaster ride through <laughs> potholes and everything and then right when i'm about to fall off the edge of the earth i see this cliff coming and i look off to my right and there's a house there and then there's will standing there waving at me I'm like uh, <laughs> dude can you get any farther from civilization that <laughs> i like my privacy <laughs> yeah. But uh yeah, it was absolutely awesome. I mean, you have one of the you have like my dream house with the uh the, the timber framing inside. Very, very cool. Thanks, man. Thanks. Um yeah, we had a lot of fun and you left a little skin in my in my shop. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We're shooting a, a clip and I'm I'm like popping up behind this bench and I didn't have my pop-up quite calculated right and I banged the bench and I just thought I, I hit it. Uh, but if any of you are looking at the video, you'll probably see this little triangular spot here. <laughs> I left a chunk of skin on his bench. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> but we wanted to do yeah. a, a collab together. And uh, he had these hunks of cherry burl that are just gorgeous. Um, and so we're going to be doing a interesting video. I'm not going to tell too much other than we'll be turning. Uh, but this week, I, you know, okay, you're thinking about turning a bull. And in the past, I, you know, I've never turned a bull on my spring pull lathe. I've just, I've turned them on a power lathe before. And, you know, you, you, you chuck it up, but either you can do it between centers and rough out the outside and, or you can put it on a face plate or, you know, there's a, there's a bunch of different ways to, to do a bull. 
Uh, whereas on a spring pole lathe, you have to have something for the rope to wrap around. And so you, you glue on a mandrel or you, you pound in a mandrel. And I have been working at this for the last three days trying to make this bowl happen. <laughs> it is fighting me every step of the way. I, I've gone through like three different designs of mandrel. Uh, and I still haven't roughed the outside of the bowl. <laughs> so <laughs> it seems like it seems like we're on that same page of like it's just not coming rough, together. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> It's like, you know, you have those days where you've been in the shop for half a day and you're like, you know, if I were wise, I would just, I would just call it a day. I just yeah. go in and just, just chalk it up as like a sick day and just try and keep the attitude positive. And I'm <laughs> unfortunately, I'm the opposite. If something like frustrates me, I just get more angry and more determined. Yeah. It's usually I'm, I'm the same. Problem. Then the next day, once I'm level headed, I just start over. <laughs> <laughs> So everything was just completely in vain. <laughs> so uh, hopefully I'll have this this thing done today, but if the way it's been going, I probably won't have it done until next week. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. You, if we have to, uh, man, what am I working on? I'm working on lots of stuff. So uh, the Grizzly Challenge video launched last Thursday after the podcast, um, and that has gone uh, fantastic. Um, I haven't seen those yet. I gotta check that out. Yeah, so it's got about 27,000 views this That's week. Great. Um, and it's been a big bump to my subscribers. Well, it's been a good bump to my subscribers. I, I gained about 4,500 subscribers wow. this week. Yeah, so uh, – and and uh, you guys can go vote. If, after you watch the video, you guys can vote uh, for your favorite. <laughs> between, yeah, if you between... go vote on it, you look down in the comments, it's like, will, 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 will. <laughs> Will, 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 will. <laughs> yeah, it's um I felt I was I felt kind of bad uh that I kind of ran away with it, but I also was really proud of of the finished product. So uh I shouldn't feel bad for yeah. that. No, and James actually got Fair to check out the oh finished. man, seeing him in person, yeah. the figure on that stuff is just like nothing I've ever seen before. I mean, you, you've seen highly figured wood. This is like beyond highly figured. It is phenomenal stuff. I mean, I was just drooling at the cutoffs alone <laughs> it was gorgeous gorgeous wood yeah um so uh finished those projects uh, i just launched a video on turning a live edge cherry burl bowl um I, that launched this morning uh and then um what else am I working? Oh, the live edge vanity is okay. Yeah, I'll join the club uh, with nothing going right. Uh, so <laughs> I, I I cut out the uh, template for the this vessel sink that sits halfway into the the vanity top, um, and so it's you know maybe a sixteen inch ovalish shape, um, and then I want to go fill the void in the in the cherry slab top with um epoxy and uh i thought wet systems because there's so much uh volume to fill this void i thought west systems would a get too hot as it cured to do in a full pour um and b was too expensive and so I reached out to the epoxy man himself, Peter Brown, and he said, well, try Envirotex Lite. It should work really well, and it doesn't get as hot when it cures. And I said, sure. So I ordered it. Um, it showed up, uh, got drop kicked in the shipment. Uh, the hardener bottle had busted open in the box. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, and so it leaked all over my garage floor. Uh -huh. uh, so I reached out to Amazon. They said, well, we can't, you can't ship it back because it's a hazardous material, but we'll just send you a new one. I said, okay, great. So they shipped me a new one. Uh, I did the pour Monday night. I, I did it in three pours. Um, and this last pour, after letting it sit overnight, and it's supposed to cure, well, it's supposed to get hard within four to six hours and then a full cure in 72 hours. I went back yesterday at... I don't know, two o'clock and it was still sticky. Um, like not hard at all. And I, me I measured everything. So it was the equal amounts like you're supposed to. And I, I count my shop was just too cold for it to, to harden. So I've let my propane heater run in there overnight 
to keep it at a nice 75 degrees and I haven't checked on it this morning, but hopefully that will have cured. Uh, but yeah, cause I'm kind of at a standstill. I can't make any dust in my shop while this epoxy is sticky because it'll just get dusty. Yeah. And yeah, I might have to start over and scrape this stuff out and use West systems, but I don't know. It's, I'm very frustrated by that. See, I've used West system, but you, I don't, I don't pour it much more than like a quarter inch at a time. Yeah, uh, because if you pour it, it when it when it gets hot, um, like I, I have done two inches before, um, but it gets so hot that it, it creates all these thousand tiny little air bubbles in it. Mm -hmm. It looks cool, it looks really cool, but uh, yeah, not what you want. Yeah, um, yeah, the bubbles. I've done it both ways, where I've poured from the bottom. Um, because Martin Goebel suggested that in some popular woodworking video, I think, um, where you take the top and you tape the top, the voids in the top, then you flip the piece over and you pour from the bottom. Um, but I had terrible, terrible luck with that, and I still got bubbles um, in a table. And so now I like to fill from the top down and then just use a torch or a heat gun to blow out the bubbles as they That's as they rise to the surface. Yeah. Um, but West Systems, I've actually mixed up more epoxy than, than I, I thought I needed more epoxy than I needed. And so I left some in the mixing container and as it cured, it actually melted the mixing container. Yeah. <laughs> I actually had one catch on fire once. Wow. I was um, building my airplane and, uh, uh, there was a pile of sawdust nearby and it heated up enough to combust the sawdust. Whoa. Like, oh, way to start a sentence. I was building my airplane. <laughs> so, so casually i've i've built two I've, I've worked on building two yeah that's crazy. wow i forgot cool. to say i actually did put out a video this last week um i put out uh kind of the intro to leather working video which was it's like a complete 180 from my normal content because it was like 40 minutes long and uh very in-depth so but it went went over really well. I mean, it didn't get the normal amount of views, but uh, the reception has been really good on it. So, gotten a lot of requests to kind of continue along with that. I forgot to say that earlier. Yeah, I'd really like to get into some leather work. Um, I just I've got too many projects like planned and unfinished in my shop. Like James, you saw my Rube bow bench that's just sitting there waiting to be finished. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, and I get comments on that weekly. Hey, are you going to do any more videos on the Rubo? Are you going to, have you finished the Rubo? Hey, where's the rest of the Rubo? Yeah. Uh, it's just like, I get commissions and projects and honeydews and uh, I keep looking at it and I keep making myself sad, but I do want to get into leather work. So I'm going to watch your videos, Zach. Yep. Bring some, uh, bring some uppers with you. That was, that was a cool video actually. Yeah. Leather working is one of those really, um, there tends to be a lot of repetitive things in it, like punching all the holes and sewing yeah. thread and, and rubbing down things. And so it tends to be a very Zen wood. Uh, it zen is. Project. It's like almost meditative. Like yeah. I, it's, um, I'm kind of taking a break because I just did so much of it like in December. Um, but, uh, I mean, it's really nice when you're, you know, if you, get done in the shop early and you got to spend some time with your family or something. And if they're watching TV, I can just, you know, kind of sit in the background and crank out some, some yeah. stuff. It's nice. still yeah, they, feel like I'm being productive, although it doesn't necessarily feel like I'm. The know. stitching pony you have, isn't that supposed to be yeah. sit on the chair and you sit on it? Yeah. Um, I didn't want necessarily to have like working between your legs. Yeah. Well, I just didn't want to, uh, you know, a 40 minute video of my crotch. So <laughs> I put it on the table and, uh, and, and just film that it's a better angle. I, I hope, I mean, maybe there's, maybe there's some people out there that would be interested in that content. But, you know. Matt Corona, I've been told he likes crotch. <laughs> I've, I've definitely had some videos where people have commented, uh, you know, if I'm doing like a, like a quarter down, shot of me working either if i'm planing something you know which is at bench height which is also my crotch height um where people are like nice crotch shot just put out like a two minute video of just standing in front of the camera 
April <laughs> Fools or something. <laughs> well, there's um, uh, Paul Jackman's April Fools video is like what three hours long of water trickling down the the creek. <laughs> I remember that. You guys ever see that uh, Nick Offerman? Uh, it was a Scotch sponsored. I think it was a uh, Lag- uh, Lagavulin Scotch. It was like a Christmas video where he just sat in front of a fireplace and sipped scotch for an hour and didn't say a word. <laughs> yeah, I think I saw that. What do you say we get into a few questions? Because we actually have a, a couple. Um, let's see. Uh, Guff's Woodshop um, asks, uh, what would be a good po- epoxy for attaching wood to metal? You guys have any direct experience with that? Whatever um, I have just with- on the shelf. <laughs> Uh, usually I use, like if I'm setting, uh, pins in like knife scales or something like that, um, like brass to whatever wood, um, I just use my West systems and I've never had any fallout. Yeah. For, for small applications, um, like, you know, a knife scale or anything, you have a thin bead or you're going along the grain of the wood. Um, pretty much any epoxy is going to do a fairly decent job. Yes, there will be some slight differences and, um, but most epoxies are going to be okay. Uh, in the, the, the theater world, we used to do a ton of gluing large sheets of, of wood down to steel or aluminum. And in that case, uh, liquid nails was the best because it, it actually had a bit of a give to it. So as mm-hmm. the wood would expand and contract or movement would happen, um, the steel doesn't move, but the wood does. The the liquid nails would actually provide a really nice flexible surface to it. But if you're doing something like a knife scale, that adds a thickness in between the steel that you might not want. I use bolts usually if I'm attaching wood to metal. <laughs> yeah. <that's laughs> what and what application would do you think that he's talking about? Like, are you, are we talking about like a steel, like a big steel rod into like a wooden handle, or are we just talking about accents like a ferrule on like? Yeah, a, like a I guess that makes a big difference because I immediately jump to the theater world where I'm, you know I'm building a four story tall theater set where you know it's all steel structure that you're gluing wood onto, and <laughs> or self tapping <laughs> screws. That's another common one. Yeah, uh, let's see. Oh. All right. We have another question from uh, Tracy Keaton. Um, I'm really having problems with finger joints on some of my boxes. Any tips you guys have? Uh, practice on some scrap to get your setup just right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I guess it asks, are you using a, a table saw? Or are you hand cutting them? Or are you using a bandsaw? Um, because each one of those are going to be a whole new world of methodology. Yeah, you know, table yeah, saw is, but, is, is all about the setup because once you get the, the keys set up, you get your jig set up, it's just re- rinse and repeat. Yeah, and it's pretty fast and easy to set up a jig, and you don't it doesn't need to be elaborate. Like you don't need to make a whole sled. You can just screw a board onto your miter gauge um, and then you know, experiment with some scrap wood, get your keys set right, and then you can cut. I, I like to cut mine uh, you know, two at a time. So you have the alternate the offset piece with the yeah. you know so you bump you bump up your your piece of wood next to the key and then you have one offset by the width of the key and then i just clamp them together and run them through and then put them over the key and then um uh, it's all, and table saw is all about setup like james said um but i've I never tried a, cutting them. i did a video last oh. year about a uh, cross cut sled and i made a um, finger joint jig on it mm-hmm. it was I kind of came up with what I thought at the time was a pretty tricky way of setting up the the jig so that it's perfect. But he just uh, commented back, uh, "Hand cut." I don't have a table saw. Oh, so in that case, um, <laughs> why in the world are you hand cutting uh, finger joints when you can dovetails are actually far easier than finger joints uh, because there's a little bit of give in the in the flexibility of them. Uh, they don't. It doesn't like compound add up. Um, and so, yeah, that's why I, I never cut finger joints because dovetails are easier and they look better. And they're, they're more functional. Um, but again, that's yeah. a personal preference. Um, they're a little the, bit more forgiving too. Yeah. Uh, the, 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 the problem with, with finger joints and hand cutting them is you're doing all the exact same maneuvers of, um, uh, that you would with dovetails. You, you cut one side and you make it the way you want it to be. And then you lay that down on the other side and transfer the marks. 
Um, but then every cut you have needs to be at 90 degrees to a surface. Um, and so you have to be very, very precise. And there ends up being a lot of cleanup with a chisel. And every time you use a chisel to do cleanup, you're going to just be creating gaps. Um, it's, it's kind of the, the nature of the beast when you're, when you're learning, um, cleaning up with a chisel will create gaps. Um, so <laughs> you're, you're, it's kind of like banging your head against the wall. Uh, pretty much at that point, the only way to do it without creating a jig to guide your saw is practice, 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 practice. Um, but yeah, you can use a, a 90 degree jig that holds on to a Japanese saw. There's several magnetic ones that will guide that. Um, but who wants to use a jig? <laughs> Oh, we do have a uh, um, a thing to the uh, the epoxy on wood. Um, uh, really, uh, where did he go? Um, oh, yeah, um, small stainless into a groove in the wood. Well, that's a lot easier. I just used just about any epoxy out there. Yeah, you could even so, use like CA glue, but yeah, depending on how much use it's going to get. Yeah, because the the groove should be, you know, as long as the groove is tight enough to hold the work, you're just looking for something to keep it from sliding around over time. In which case then I'd, oh, I'd use West System, but that's because I have like three gallons of it on hand. Um, but I would probably, if I didn't have that, just go to the store and get a, a, a cheap five minute or 30 minute epoxy, however long it would take me to work it in. Mm -hmm. Glue it in and be done with it and then sand it flush. It sounds like maybe they're making a marking gauge to put a piece of stainless in the beam. Maybe that or an accent piece that would run around it. Yeah. Huh. Cool. I want to answer this. I want James to answer this question from Hammer and Neil. <laughs> what did James do before YouTube? He seems to know all about all sorts of different manufacturing processes. <laughs> First of all, I have to say, I love that name, Hammer and Neil. That, yeah, that's that's, a, that's yeah. a good name. Um, uh, uh, I have I, I have been working since I was a kid. Um, my my first job was installing siding on a second story of a garage, um, and so I, I I've been you know roofing and um, and 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 siding and flooring and finishing and framing. I've done every trade that is in construction. Um, I've owned a construction business. I was uh, foreman of a subdivision being built. Um, then I got into theater work and in theater work, you do everything you do, you know, foam carving, sculpting, lighting, electrical. Um, I, I was a certified electrician for a while. Um, I got my master's in theater, uh, and then there were a whole bunch of other things. And I, I, I always had a hobby of having hobbies. Um, so I find something I don't know and dive into it. Um, like, uh, when just before moving out here, just before I became a hand tool woodworker, uh, my my main hobby was making a fiberglass airplane, a four seat, um, two hundred mile an hour capable airplane, um, and I I sold that project not because I got bored in it, but because um, I couldn't move it, and I found out I was getting very allergic to the fiberglass, and it was becoming more and more of a problem, uh, but. Yeah, I had fun making that. That was fun. <laughs> so, yeah, whenever someone asks me, you know, what, what, why are you, why do you have all these weird experiences? It's because I've, um, I've moved twenty five times, lived in you know, a bunch of states, and um, I've every time we move, I get a new hobby or a new job and new experiences, and uh, that's my life. So, <laughs> wow. And now I teach hand tool woodworking online. <laughs> For now. Until you get a new yeah. hobby. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Uh, joke of the week? Yeah, I was just seeing yes. if I had any other questions. No, I don't have anything other. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, let's see. Uh, joke of the week. Um, we Jim choices. Dreckel asks, um, where Dreckel. do the French keep their trees? Between their twos and their fours. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> But I'll bump. I can't believe we haven't run out of these yet. This is great. <laughs> yeah, I have another. I have two more in the hopper. I haven't put the other one down yet. We better uh, um, ration them just in case. We should always have like two and two. <laughs> the better part is, as you get lower and closer to the bottom, they get better and better, or worse and worse, depending upon how you look at it. <laughs> 
We should so like get you know? uh I'm reading back issues of fine woodworking. Um just because there's a lot of gems. Whenever I get a new issue of fine woodworking, wood magazine, popular woodworking, um, I feel like I just kind of skim through it and, you know, read the you know, the the highlighted projects that are on the, the cover, you know, like you know, shaker side table, page 54. Um, and I just kind of glance through it and then my daughter gets my attention or I don't have time to read it or something. And then they did just sit in a stack. Um, so I've been going back through and actually like reading my old magazines and there's some really great gems in there. Um, uh, like in this, uh, in the Grizzly video, uh, I did a tip on using a dollar store bag of drinking straws for glue cleanup like in a like if you're doing a mortise and tenon and you have a 90 degree uh glue up in that corner um using a but just a drinking straw to get into that crevice for glue cleanup works like yeah really 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 well um and i and people are commenting on that like oh my god that's so cool like where where did you learn that trick did you make it up and uh it's just a I think it was a user submitted, a reader submitted tip in fine woodworking. Yeah. That's yep. one of my favorite little tips. Yeah. And yes, Jim, I do keep them in the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of the uh, coolest things about just YouTube in general is how many like little tips and yeah. tricks that you pick up from watching other people. Like mm -hmm. so many like invaluable tricks that have just been probably passed down for generations you just get access to all of them <laughs> yeah. well the cool thing is even though it's like one of those tricks that you think everyone knows of um, you know, everyone has to learn it for the first time yeah. and so there's you know a, a ton of people who are getting into your channel for the first time and so it's everything that you think is new everything you think is old is is actually new to someone yeah. And that's funny. So talking about working every job in in the construction field, um, I grew up a, a, a contractor's son. Um, so I was framing houses at twelve with my dad, um, and you know I learned how to how to do framing and construction from him, who you know learned along the way. However, he learned. And then when you get alongside a friend, another framer. Um, so I've got a friend that lives in town, Joe, and he has a completely different education and framing from, you know, whatever. And when we get together and build something together, we do things totally differently and we pick up tricks from each other. Like, Whoa, like I never thought about doing it like that. That's awesome. You know, uh, that's one of the things and, I love about moving all over the United States is everywhere I moved, there were new, there were new names for things and new methods and different things of, of doing it because of different weather conditions. Mm -hmm. um, you know, down in Alabama, they don't think much about snow load on a on a house, but they do think about ice load. Uh, whereas, you know, in northern Michigan, ice load is eh, kind of even less you have an ice dam. But you you think about the snow load, you might have you know four or five feet on top of the house. <laughs> yeah, or like in, in the the tornado alley, you know, yeah. they think about things totally differently Earthing than you know. I'm in that type of thing that we're like, oh, hurricane clips. That's kind of new. <laughs> Yeah, uh, well, that's funny because in Virginia we do have to have hurricane clips, um, right. hurricane clips, and uh, we have to account for wind shear, uh, which I think is crazy. Um, James, you saw that outside window wall in my great room, that timber frame <laughs> yeah. window wall, and to get uh, to get it approved, um, it had to withstand I think a hundred mile per hour wind shear, mm -hmm. and we would like never get that kind of wind, but. See where I'm at. That's that's like because we're we're the wind tunnel for Chicago. Uh huh. So that's a, yeah, different things, yeah. different places. It's kind of a cool world. Yeah. Let's see. I've been uh, watching Wood and Shop. Uh, when I first got into hand tools, uh, his channel was absolutely invaluable because he has a uh, he has a whole thing on his website geared towards uh, people getting into hand tools for the first time, particularly um, historical or. Uh, um, historical methods and tools of woodworking and he goes into all the different types of tools what are they used for how do they work and it really goes into detail on that well he just put out a video on winding sticks as he's making uh the benches for his shop because he's about to be opening up a school in may uh, at his place in virginia and uh yeah, yeah, he's, definitely look at yeah he's what would you say like 20 30 minutes from you yeah 20 30 minutes something like that yeah 
Uh, so Joshua Farnworth at Wooden Shop. Um, really, really cool channel and a lot of cool hand tool woodworking. And yeah, definitely look at it. Yeah. Zach, How about you, you Zach? Um, so I'm still reading uh, Walden, which is such an incredible book. Um, <laughs> it has, I'm probably a little over halfway through it. Um, it's one of those that you have to spend some time digesting, but it's definitely made its way onto like my top five books list. It's just incredible. So anybody who um, isn't familiar with that book, it's, I highly, highly, highly recommend it. Very good. Cool. Right now. What's your uh, favorite tool of the week? Uh, my favorite tool of the week I used quite a bit yesterday is uh, get a good set of neodymium magnets. I bought a whole <laughs> bunch a while ago from uh, Amazon and I just, I'm constantly using them. Like they're just it's one of those tools that if you have them in your shop, you'll use them, you'll find a use for them. So yesterday I was gluing up or uh, welding up, tacking up the like pyramid base for the sculpture. So it's, I mean, yeah, it's, it's a pyramid of sheet metal and trying to get those edges lined up at like 45 degrees and the 18 gauge, it's probably two feet tall. So it's wanting to bow and warp and, you know, so, uh, I actually just wrapped the magnets in rags so that I could actually stick them onto the metal and pull the sides out till they matched up perfectly and just mm -hmm. tack everything and slide the magnets up. So it was, I, did, I, it worked really, really well. That's a really cool trick. <laughs> so, yeah, and the, the neodymium ones, like I think I I have like quarter inch ones and ha uh, three eighths inch thick. They're dangerously powerful. I mean, yeah. and I'm not not uh, exaggerating. You can it will pinch your skin off if you have two of them in the hand. So, oh wow, uh, yeah, I have a so set of three hundred pound. They're three hundred pound pull a piece. You put them together, it's six hundred pounds if they touch. Uh, putting your hand yeah. in between would be like four hundred pounds. Yeah, that's crazy. Wow. Uh, but yeah, one of the other things I was doing, cause I needed to make templates. I'm, I'm cutting these pieces out on uh, four by eight sheets of 18 gauge. And in some of the dimensions, I don't have a straight edge long enough to clamp it. So I have an aluminum straight edge. that's not obviously eight feet long. So um, you can kind of, I could actually just hold it in place with the magnets and use that as a cutting guide. But one of the tricks I found, because those things are so hard, you can't pull, like you lit, you cannot pull them straight off of any metallic oh, yeah. surface. You need to slide them to the edge or do something. So I actually just stuck it to a, um, like a, a steel putty knife and let it suck through that. So when I need to take it off, you can just kind of pry it off with the uh, putty knife because it's already sandwiched between them. So they're, they're pretty cool. Cool. If you ever want to have fun, um, drop a neodymium magnet down a copper pipe. Yeah, it just oh yeah, it takes it forever. Feels. Just like that's cool. If, um, if you haven't experienced see... that, you got to try it. It's it's one of those mind blowing things in physics. <laughs> <laughs> did you guys see uh, Ryan shop built? Just did a video on neodymium magnets. Um, he had a really cool. He took a steel ruler. Uh, what do you do? Magnet trammel for making circles. Uh, you, yeah, you just have to watch. I, I had to find it, um, huh. but it was it was just a magnet tips video, and it was just really cool. Cool. Well, what you got, Will? Yeah. Uh, uh, my are we talking about tools? Is that what we're talking about? <laughs> my favorite my tool of the week. <laughs> my favorite tool is um, if this then that. Uh, if this ifttt dot com, um, and it's a fantastic uh time saver so uh, i used to use it for any long-term viewers of my channel you knew that i had a craigslist addiction um and i used to use it for craigslist if i was looking for something in particular like a tractor implement or a certain kind of tool um, you go to if this then that dot com and you can actually set parameters so if somebody posts something on a craigslist with the word bandsaw in the description or the, the title um then i get an email uh so in the morning I'll wake up and I'll have three or four different emails from if this, then that, Hey, this showed up in a Craigslist search. Um, but more recently I have been using it. Um, the most recent thing I did was I set up so you can, 
uh, they call them recipes and there's a bunch out there and people just submit them and you can use it for literally everything. Like, you know, if the weather's going to be below freezing, send me an email. Um, but I used it. So every time I post a photo to Instagram now, it also posts a native Twitter post um, automatically. So you don't just see an Instagram link in Twitter, but you actually see the actual photo and like, it's like I posted it to Twitter separately. Um, and it's a huge time saver, especially for any kind of social media, uh, which I've been trying to focus on lately. Cool. Have you guys have you guys used that at all? Have you have you ever heard of it? Yeah. Oh yeah. I actually use it quite a bit for uh, home things. So if um, so if something happens on one of my home devices, it sends a notification to my phone or um, connections. Or I have several set up that if I say this to Google Home, then this happens. Cool. It's a cool point. Right yeah, you do know that uh, now Craigslist has that embedded in the service, so you can actually set up your own search parameters in Craigslist. I did not know that, but this is this is old school. This is like <laughs> three, four years ago. No, I, I keep finding that with if this then that is I'll, I'll I'll find this really cool workaround that I can make this program talk to this program and uh, everything works great. And then suddenly I find out those two programs got together and now there's an internal thing that fixes it. It's like oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I forgot to mention it earlier in the show, but I'm I'm really considering. So I'm looking at uh, a big, bigger anvil because I, th I think I've outgrown my 70 pounder. <laughs> um, this year, I really want to do a lot more forging. Um, so definitely need a larger anvil that's not a farrier's anvil. And it's incredible how hard it is to find new anvils. Um, old ones that are battered and that are not a pattern I'm looking for, or you can kind of find them around, but I'm looking for like a South German pattern. And there's about four manufacturers and none of them, they're all having issues with casting right now. So I'm like probably going to have to wait two or three months and I'm probably going to end up dropping about $2,000 for an anvil. I was going to say those are plus shipping. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So <laughs> that, and I'm also, contemplating a power hammer which would be my big purchase Ooh. of the year Ooh. that's like six thousand bucks but i got all this tool steel i got this uh s7 tool steel for i got like 80 pounds of it for 150 bucks or something some of it's well, like they... two two and a half inches and i'm like man trying to like draw that out by hand would be a nightmare yeah. well there you go you can use if this then that for power hammer on craigslist <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> Yeah, those don't exist. Like, I feel like you'd be surprised, man. You'd really be surprised at what pops up, especially if you make it a bit, bit broader. Because I mean, something like that, you're willing to to drive a distance for. Yeah, um, the, I, I am really surprised at what pops up because I have, I have I just, several I, searches that are like anything within uh, 200 miles. The the only like smithing gear I ever find is like people who bought deep stuff and try to get into our sub hundred pound anvils and uh you know like backyard forges out of break drums and like just there's just not a lot of good smithing stuff or like an old an yeah, old I, anvil that's cracked and they want you know three thousand dollars because it looks cool you know yeah. they're not actually using it so it's just at least where i live in florida like there's just really not a whole lot down here um Especially I see when you a lot. know what you want. That makes it more difficult. I see a lot, not of anvils, because I've been looking for an anvil for a very long time, and I can only find people that want to sell them as collectible, you yeah, know. That's the issue is, you know, they're they're battered or, you know, cracked or the, you know, the, yeah. the top is uh, sway back or it's just, especially yeah. when you have a pattern that you know you want. Um, but you know, something like a, like a machinist lathe, like a metal lathe or... Um, power hammer or anything like that. I find a lot of uh, businesses that are, you know, going out of business or the the guy's retiring and he's auctioning off all of his, you know, machinist equipment and things like that. Um, look for those, like uh, like business sales. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We'll see what happens. Um, I just have to try and justify. Uh, the cost it's like do i think i could actually make if i spend six thousand dollars on a power hammer do i think i could actually crank out six thousand dollars worth of 
power hammer projects in the next year <laughs> i probably could but still that's and then if i know you know i know i'm going to be moving in a year and a half i'm like god do i really want to do that and then have to pay probably another thousand dollars to ship the thing to oregon when we move back so i don't know yeah, yeah i don't know how about you james what's your favorite tool i have to go with the mandrel um particularly a uh, spring pole turning mandrel uh this is it's when when I first looked at them and I saw a few ideas, uh, it was a fairly straightforward, simple idea. Uh, but if you really get into it, some of the the workhorse traditional mandrels are are very complicated little tool, um, and you'll have some of them that are spike driven, um, some of them that are um, tapered tenons that go into the blank, and they get really uh, really complicated in how functional they are. But um, it's an interesting tool, and I'm, I'm looking forward to showing it off in the video because it's kind of one of those things I can't really describe in audio terms, other than the fact if you imagine a if you imagine a cylinder, so take a, a spindle, turn a spindle on your lathe um, about a foot long, about uh, two to two and a half inches in diameter, and then you want to take this this cylinder that you created and attach it to a bowl blank so you have something for the rope to wrap around on the, the lathe. Um, how do you actually get that to attach? And if it's a lightweight bowl, um, you can go with a fairly easy connection. But this um, blank that I'm currently turning is around like eight to nine pounds and slightly off balance in because it hasn't been roughed yet. And there's a lot of torque that goes onto that, that small fixture, especially as it starts and stops four times a second. So four times a second, it comes to a complete stop and you have the centrifugal force of that bowl twisting on the mandrel. Uh, it's incredible amount of forces and I'm just, I'm getting blown away by this thing and um, I better stop talking cause I'm geeking out now. <laughs> <laughs> Not to mention that the blank is sopping wet. Yeah. Yeah. These are uh, incredibly heavy things and uh, it makes it easy for turning, but just, <laughs> yeah, I bet you got like a shower turning that one. Oh yeah. It, I mean, the, I, I turned that last bowl and my out feed, no, no, I'm sorry. The in feed table of my planer is in line with the chuck of my uh, lathe. Uh -huh. And so I came back yesterday and looked and there was a, a rust pattern where it had sprayed off of the bowl blank <laughs> onto the infeed table of my planer. <laughs> and I was like, oh, well, <laughs> I might have to move that. <laughs> what do you have that problem? Because I get put like, on, like, on, uh, like like on your planer bed to keep rust off. Um, I... Honestly, I've used Bow Shield and I hate it. Uh, it yeah. doesn't work for me. I don't know if it's just Virginia humidity or what, but uh, I mean, I've come back, you know, I've sprayed the stuff on, come back, and it's like completely rusted. Um, historically, I've used Pace Wax, uh, which works really well um, for me and it makes the tabletop slick. Um, but recently, I've been using a product called Slip It, um, which is an organic compound. It's totally safe for you know bare hands and stuff like that um and it's a tabletop lubricant and rust preventer hmm. but what I, do you I, use i i use whatever is closest to me like <laughs> that can be i have bow shield i have uh uh sometimes paste wax actually works pretty good for me yep. um, none of that's permanent i mean every couple months you might have to hit it again but that's not really a big deal usually whatever you know if you have something on it even after a month or two or a couple months it's usually comes off pretty quick with a scotch bright pad um so either, even cutting oil like the other day like I, I actually turned something that was this little bowl like last week that i turned and i just I, it's right next to my drill press and i had some like cutting oil that i mixed up with mineral spirits and machine oil and i just wiped it off and wiped it down with some of that and haven't had any issues so i think i don't think it's as important what you use as how frequent you use it mm -hmm. like if you just keep your eye on it i feel like if you just if you're mindful of it i feel like you won't have any problems i don't think it in my experience everything's about the same just keeping it, up. and it just and it just makes the tabletop so much nicer to use like on a table saw like a freshly waxed yeah, table saw yeah. top especially with like a, like a cross cut sled or something mm -hmm. yeah Cool. Well, you guys have uh, been listening to us for almost an hour now, and I feel sorry for you. <laughs> <laughs>
that's about it for this week. Uh, we're going to be uh, back here next Thursday at uh, 9 Central, 10 Eastern. And we're looking forward to uh, seeing if you come in live. If you have any questions, feel free to email us or uh, let us know in any of our multiple contact methods. And uh, that's about it for this week. So until next time, see you later. See you later. Adios.